Hey everyone, today I want to get into how you make money as a composer because there are many different ways film composers, media composers are making money. So I just want to go over all the different ways that you can have an income so that maybe you have an easier time making this your actual full-time job. So as media composers, we have a really wide range of skills which also gives us some measure of flexibility when it comes to making money. So the number one source um, of income for a lot of film composers is the upfront fee. The fee you're getting when you're hired to do a gig. Usually you get 50% paid upfront and then 50% upon completion of the project. Sometimes it's divided up into you know three different parts, uh, th three different payments, but overall, that is one large source of income. Sometimes the fee is separate from the production budget, sometimes it's a package deal, but overall you're going to get some money for your work up front. That goes for film, TV, video games, theme parks, live shows, whatever it is. The one exception would be uh, music libraries. Some of them pay upfront fees to have something produced, they're usually very low, but some of them pay up front, but a lot of the time you're actually feeding into music libraries for no upfront fee at all. Then the second thing that you're going to get is royalties. Now it depends on whether you work in video games or film or TV or in music licensing. The um, amount that you're gonna be paid is gonna be very different. Um, for example, library composers very heavily rely on their royalty payments. Film and TV composers like to have royalties as well, for sure, um, but it varies if something goes onto streaming services, onto traditional TV, if it has a theatrical run, all that kind of stuff pays differently. But definitely after a couple of years, once you've accumulated enough productions or you've fed libraries enough tracks, you should be able to supplement your income with a substantial amount of royalties. Sometimes the royalties even exceed the upfront payments, sometimes they don't, it really depends. Video games are traditionally buyouts for the most part, so they don't necessarily pay royalties. But so outside of those two main income streams, the upfront fee and then the back-end payments, the royalties, um, what else do you have? Well, for starters, you could utilize social media. You could get affiliate links, so you get some profit sharing when you um, get people to buy a product. You can get ad revenue, for example, if you're on YouTube, you can enter the partnership program, get some ad revenue when people watch your videos. You can get sponsorships um, from, from brands. You can also do stuff like Patreon, where you have subscribers and, and um, and you offer specific content just for people who are subscribed. A lot of platforms generally also have channel subscriptions or channel sponsorships. You can sell merchandise, you can sell, you know, little sample libraries or, you know, um, templates or whatever you made really, whatever people, whatever your audience might be interested in. A lot of composers that make money online also sell classes. That can be Zoom classes or master classes, but it can also be entire programs that they've made from scratch. Personally, I'm signed up on Buy Me A Coffee where you can just donate money uh, for my content. So if you want, head over to Buy Me A Coffee. Um, link is in the description if you wanna, um, you know, help sponsor this content or just, you know, show your appreciation for what I do. Then a lot of composers supplement their income with teaching as well. That can be college classes, that can be online classes, that can be private lessons, but um, it can also be instrumental lessons, uh, whatever it is. Um, usually that's a good way to be flexible and still supplement your income as a composer. Some film composers are also excellent instrumentalists. They are studio musicians, so they will um, also be hired to just perform on their main instrument and um, get paid for that up front. But also if it's a union gig, particularly in LA, you also get benefits and you get back-end payments. So that also actually supplements your passive income as well. 
Then, of course, a route that a lot of younger people go is assistantships. That can be a full-time salaried position, but that can also be a freelance type position where you just contract it in on a per project basis and you help out with whatever the composer needs you to help out with. That can range all the way from mock-ups to uh, Pro Tools work to admin work. I mean, it doesn't really matter what it is. Um, I have a video about assistance and the different kinds of assistance if you want to check that out, if you're interested in that sort of thing. A lot of composers also supplement their income by being techs, especially, again, um, beginning composers. Um, a lot of the more established composers need help with tech work. Uh, so there's often a need for any type of skill in that area. You can also make sample libraries or other music software if you have that skill, or you can work for a sample library developer, of course. It's something that I did as well. That was my first job. Some composers are simultaneously music editors as well. So that's nice because you get to be part of a different union and you get the, those union benefits. And generally music editors are uh, more needed and, and better compensated than composers. So that can be a nice side income. A lot of my friends also started working as orchestrators or copyists or librarians, especially for music prep houses um, to again, supplement the income with upfront fees. But again, if it's a union thing, especially here in LA, you also get back-end payments and benefits, which is very good if you're, you know, a starving composer. Very few composers supplement the income by being music supervisors, but it's not unheard of. Music supervisors are the people that are responsible for the song placements in film and TV. Um, it would kind of help if you also have like a music business degree or some kind of degree because you're also responsible for music clearances, which is kind of a legal thing. Um, but some people can do that. There are also some composers that are incredible mix engineers that uh, can rival actual full-time mix engineers. And so some of them will supplement their income by just doing mixing for other people. There's also often a need for lyricists and songwriters, especially for musicals, of course, but um, a, lot of, um, a lot of productions have custom songs written for them. So if you are a great songwriter, you may have a good chance to be paired up with a film composer who's doing the score, for example, because especially a lot of um, children's productions, they always need songs in addition to the score. And then there's one that doesn't really have anything to do with music, but that um, probably everyone should do, but particularly artists or freelancers that don't get, you know, retirement or, you know, any of those benefits that you get when you're an employee, um, which is invest in something, invest in stock, for example, um, have some kind of investment portfolio, because that's going to be most likely your retirement. I'm not a, a, an advisor, I'm, I'm not a financial advisor, so I can't tell you how to do that. But I've started doing that a couple of years ago and it's a really good idea. It's much better than having your money sit in a savings account that does not give you a lot of returns. Um, the stock market is always growing um, over time. It will also crash several times, but the point is, you know, you put your money there and you don't touch it for hopefully decades to come um, so that it can just accumulate value. That is generally the goal when you invest long term. So as long as you don't need to pull out your money when there's a big crash, you're going to be fine. The overall goal is to have more than one income stream because you never know what's going to happen, especially over the past few years we've seen you know, the stock market crash and recover quickly several times, but we've also seen the economy crash. We've also seen a lot of people lose their jobs, a lot of people having to be very flexible with their income. Um, royalties, you know, are a wonky thing, especially with streaming services. We don't really know what the future of that is. Maybe it recovers, maybe it will not. Um, but during the pandemic, you know, some royalty streams were down a lot, like theatrical royalties, which are 
substantial if you have an international release. So that all of a sudden broke away for a lot of composers that have the bigger productions. So you never really know what's gonna happen. You need um, ideally several passive income streams and several active income streams just so that if one of them falls away, it's not such a big deal. That kind of goes for anyone who's freelancing. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. I hope this was helpful. Um, again, I'm on Buy Me A Coffee. If you like this content, you can like and subscribe. Um, and I'll see you in the next one.